So um, uh, as you as you heard, what I do with my company is using uh, a bunch of data sources from um, digital audiences to make sense of what they do. The context for what we do, and I wanted to set the tone from my talk straight, is uh, this. Basically, we live in a world where the internet has completely destroyed the whole kind of like uh, media business model where there was one audience and one product to sell and one way of delivering it. We kind of like in a world where we have endless versions of a product and endless variations on an audience. And so uh, the idea that you can go and do what you used to do even just 10 years ago today is totally unrealistic and it doesn't make any sense. Um, now, it's not like this stuff didn't exist before. It's not like there were millions of audiences before. It's just that before these audiences were not visible because the mass media kind of like model kept those audiences boxed up into one big chunk and kept the delivery systems straight into a few different few options, not like endless options. And therefore, the products that we could deliver as a result of that system were quite specific to that system. So they were quite limited and quite one size fit all. But if you start to be able to see what's within an audience, uh, you realize uh, what um, Raymond Williams used to say, that there are no masses, really. There's only ways of seeing people as masses, which means that depending on how you frame them, you will see what that frame is telling you to see. And once you kind of like adapt a new frame, you see something very different from what you used to see before. Uh, so we're kind of going from a situation where this is what the mainstream used to like. There was like a core at the center, and, uh, and this mainstream kind of like included popular media, cultural events, top celebrities, all packed into one kind of like plane of existence that matched the different components on one level. And we're moving into something where the center doesn't hold anymore, and you start to have a bunch of intersections where different audiences are different things, and they all pick and choose a different mix of the different things that you have to offer. And so you need to kind of like play in that kind of like new field. And uh, I always use this picture from um, this German photographer, Gersky, to show that uh, really what we're in the business of doing is uh, putting a frame on what used to be called the audience and show you that that audience actually does not exist. We are in the business of zooming in and out audiences to help you understand what's inside those audiences and how widely different the people within those audiences are and therefore how widely different your strategies for talking to them have to be. So this is what we do. We are uh, an audience intelligence company. We mix conversational signals and behavioral signals to try and help organizations understand how to talk to people, what messages to share with them, and make sure that those messages are relevant to them. Uh, we use, uh, to keep things pretty simple and clear, this is the data sources that we use. So social data, uh, which includes obviously any digital news, but also forums, blogs, all of that stuff. Search data, which includes data from Bing, data from Google that tell us how people search online for information. We use web analytics that include things like uh, you know, the data you get from Google Analytics on a website, and then we use chatbots. So chatbots are something that we use to ask rather than just listen. So instead of like relying on uh, proactive signals that the audience give us, we just go with reactive signals that we stimulate with chatbots that deliver basically kind of like conversational surveys in uh, Messenger uh, channels like Facebook Messenger or uh, Twitter direct messaging. And uh, the benefits of doing that kind of survey is that it uh, allows you to be extremely targeted on behaviors and perceptions rather than traditional programmatic advertising type targeting that is a, a, a little bit more kind of like uh, stiff in that sense. And also it fits really well with the type of analysis we do on audiences on the other side of the, of the platform. Um, so what do we do with this data? I always explain it in like this two ways. There's a, there's a what and a why to an insight. Uh, we mainly take care of the what which is what the data analytics gives us. And we use social web media and all the kind of like proactive data sources that we can access to understand what is happening in terms of like, uh, is there a perception shift? Is there a, a new association? Is there a new behavior? But then we use the more kind of like reactive data sources where we ask people questions to understand the why. And when you bring the two together, you have something that can become kind of like a defendable intelligence that you can use to make a point and define a strategy. So when you hear of social listening, this is probably 
what you think of, right? Really boring, uh, quantitative, analytical dashboards that tell you there's been a spike in conversations at this point in time, sentiment is X, this audience is this big, and uh, you know, these are the channels where these conversations have happened. And to be fair, this is where things started like a few years ago. And uh, one of the reasons why we designed Pulsar, so I'm just getting water, it's not any theatrical tricks. Uh, one of the reasons why we started Pulsar is just because this was useless for uh, doing insights on, um, for strategy. So this just gives you a really static picture of something that is like uh, almost checking what's the, how much electricity have you used in the month. This is like basically like a gas and electricity meter. It doesn't tell you what humans like and why they like it. So instead, we started moving into a, a different space where we triangulate conversation analysis on social search and all the other data streams that I've, that I've shown you before, audience analysis, so who's in this audience, how are they connected to them, what shape of the audience can we identify, and then primary research to try and add that Y element that we couldn't get from the kind of like proactive data sources that we access. So when we put these streams together, you get a really interesting mix in terms of like the value just multiplies exponentially from the same data set that you were analyzing before with a social listening lens. So um, just to keep things really tangible, this is the kind of insights you can get from this data. So um, does um, anybody know what Glossier does? It's like a cosmetics brand. Uh, and I, I've kind of like kept these um, not specifically non-military, non-government uh, as in, I'm not avoiding that stuff, it's just that I can't talk about a lot of the stuff that we do with government organization. We work with like 100 government bodies in the UK and US, but they're like quite cagey when it comes to sharing what they do. So I've shared everything else that I can share or whatever is tangent to that that I can share publicly. So when it comes to things like this, you see this is a tweet. You start unpacking a lot of potential insights in here. So you start unpacking product affinities. You start unpacking uh, design suggestions. You start unpacking benefits that people are seeking when using that product. Um, let's look at another one. So does anybody know what scrunchies are? Scrunchies are like back in fashion this year. It was one of the top trends in fashion that we measured this year. Headbands for like anybody that is bold or doesn't know what scrunchies are. Uh, I mean, I don't use scrunchies either, but I had to find out because of the study we did. So. What can you unpack from me? I wear scrunchies on the wrist, consumer behavior. I uh, can see that visually from Instagram posts. I am proud of being it uh, as if being part of a cult, like identity, trend inside. Um, I can continue, but like, okay, talking about Amazon. I wish Amazon had a rent to buy feature for movies, so if you like a film you just rent it, you can buy it minus the amount you pay to rent. So new feature and idea and naming suggestion. Explanation of the need state, a use case. Desired outcome for what you want out of that interaction with a brand. Uh, why does Spotify keep recommending me uh, to the mood booster playlist? Leave me alone and let me be sad. I'm depressed and Spotify keeps boosting my mood. It's like, fuck off, I don't want you to boost my mood. That's a pain point there. And that's a surprising insights with implications for content curation. Let me be sad. You wanna feel sad? Here's a bunch of like Johnny Cash songs. <laughs> Go and have fun. I go and be sad, actually. Uh, so in terms of search data, when you look at it, um, this is a really easy example to understand what you can get from it. You just think, okay, we can see how many times people search for X. That's useful, cool. But if you start using things like prepositions in conjunction with the subject that you're interested in, you can start getting associations. And depending on what prepositions you use, you get different kind of associations. So if I'm looking at NATO to keep things controversial, and you start associating with NATO, where, who, which, why, are. You start getting a few interesting things. So one of the top questions is, where is NATO headquarters? Fine. Another one is, can NATO expel Turkey? Another one, will NATO fall apart? <laughs> so these are like top questions that people search for when they search for NATO. If you look at vaping, obviously that kind of like seen has changed a lot over the last uh, few months. Um, what do people use it for? To lose weight? For anxiety. So you can start like building basically your marketing campaign and your strategy around the brand based on 
what people associate in terms of behaviors to the product that you're trying to sell or to the brand or to the organization that you're trying to promote, at least it's gold for us in terms of doing that at scale. So um, if you start looking at social media data in isolation, so without all the other data streams that we look at, and you only do it with a listening lens on, you basically can support pretty basic social media marketing use cases, which are okay, but they're not really where the value of this is. But if you start doing what we do, then you can unlock brand strategy use cases. So you can add tone of voice, creative development, understanding brand perception and positioning, consumer motivations, triggers and barriers. And then you can start adding experience and product design use cases. What are we actually selling? How do we build it better? How do we prioritize on our roadmap? What do we do that we should be doing better? The slides will be shared, so if you want a better picture of this, you'll have it in your inbox. But you can take pictures as well. Um, and then you can add a bunch of like other use cases on, for example, the, the one that I like the most is like the identifying white spaces. It works a little bit like economics. It's like supply and demand. On one hand, you have the audience that demands certain type of narratives and certain types of stories because that's how they behave and this is what they perceive and that is what they expect. On the other end, you have your organization that is supplying a bunch of other narratives and stories. Now, most of the times, those narratives are not aligned, so you're supplying something that the audience either doesn't seek or doesn't want or doesn't even know it exists. So there's always a mismatch between the supply and the demand. And what we do with this kind of business is trying to sync up supply and demand in terms of stories and narratives. What is the audience expecting, demanding, perceiving, and what are you selling as a narrative? So these are some of the clients we run, uh, we run audience intelligence programs for. They range from, as I'm saying, government, healthcare, but also a bunch of snazzier ones in like uh, entertainment, gaming, uh, film, cosmetics, all of that. Um, so uh, now I'm going to run into a million examples on how this stuff can be used. And it's going to get more and more complicated as we go through the examples. And hopefully you'll be asleep by then so I can sell you complicated stuff in really misleading ways. So the simple one to start with is how do perceptions in the public change when it comes to immigration? So uh, I was shocked in 2015 when Alan Kurdi died on the shores of Bodrum in Turkey. And um, not only because I was trying to have a child at the time, but also because it was fucking horrible. And uh, I was partnering at the time with the Visual Social Media Lab uh, with four universities in the UK, and we decided to do a study on how people were talking about those images that spread online. And one of the things that I realized when doing that study is that the conversation was shifting as the images were being spread online. And uh, there was a big campaign in the tabloids in the UK about uh, immigration. And um, the campaign at the time from companies like the Daily Mail was uh, pretty much about dehumanizing migrants by calling them economic migrants and showing that they didn't really have a, a reason or a, a kind of like a, um, a point in kind of like doing what we're doing other than a better financial gain for them as people. And, um, and instead, what we saw is that with the death of Alan Kurdi, people stopped actually calling them migrants and they started to call them refugees, which actually brings in a bunch of political issues that have to do with like human rights and have to do with a very different scenario for what the kind of like mass phenomenon, mass migration looked like at the time. And so what we saw is that when those images were released, uh, and for the time being since then, conversations about the same topics started switching from migrants to refugees. So we started to look in how opinion had been shifted just by people seeing that kind of specific case. And the conversation was quantitatively very different from what it was before the pictures were shared, which is at the inflection point here. And you can see other inflection points where the Paris attacks happened and um, I haven't looked in the last year, but it would be interesting to extend the study. Um, another thing we did, which is kind of like closer to home, was um, projects for the Design Museum in London last year, where we looked at how political leaders are perceived. So we're going to play a little game here. You're going to tell me what political leaders these are. But basically, what we do here, we take that social data and we apply a personality lens to that data by understanding what traits are people associating to a political leader when they talk to the leader. So whose leader, whose profile is this? So the big chunk here is corruption, control, charisma, brutality, strength, divinity, intelligence, machismo. What are we talking about? Who? Putin. Anyone says Putin? 
So that was the, this was the profile of Putin. Let's, uh, let's try kind of like a less obvious one. Remember, this is not us saying how we see them. This is how people associate personality traits to them. Uh, European leader, weakness, unemotional, strategic, uh, practical, frugal, um, confident, calm. What are we talking about? Merkel, Angela Merkel, yeah. Last one. So this one is like another European leader. Youthfulness, ambition. Macron, Macron yeah, there you go. All right, okay, cool, 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 cool. So it kind of works. It's not a big kind of like uh, survey, but it kind of like seems to be in line with what people expect uh, when we talk about these guys. Um, another interesting one, so we started the scandal with, uh, with uh, Trump and the Ukri Ukrainian Prime Minister. Uh, what is interesting here is that we're applying a story lens to the data. So instead of looking at like how many people are talking about the scandal, we said, okay, what are the elements of this story? Uh, what are the emotional reactions to the story? And what are the components of the story that people care about the most? And then we split them between Western media and VK. So we looked at like Twitter, Facebook, all of the stuff, and then we looked at things like VK. Now the most interesting and funny thing is that the feelings around the Trump Zelensky scandal, of course, in Twitter was like upset, anger, uh, happiness, because obviously people hate Trump and are gonna be happy about him falling on something like that, fear. And what do we get in VK? No big deal. It wasn't such a big thing. It was not a problem at all. It was, they were brushing it off. It was amazing how consistently across any conversation in the platform, of course, there was a lot of like bot activity, fake news activity, but it was like staggeringly opposite to what we were getting from Twitter. So you start getting some really interesting directions here. Uh, now, if you're Uber, for example, one of the lenses that you want to apply is a lens that tells you um, why are people using my services. So if you break down the conversation about Uber by the kind of like reasons for uh, using the app, you will get them overwhelmingly is about convenience. Easy transaction, multitasking, I don't need to drive, I can bring pets in it, I can avoid parking, uh, I get, I mean, I guess this is for the exact executive users, but comfort and class. So you start getting an understanding of why people go with your, um, go with your solution. Um, again, this can range from if you apply a similar lens, but to a different product, Sonos, the speakers, and you can try and understand what is the physical scene when people use Sonos. So what we did in this case, we simply looked at like locations in the house that people mention Sonos in conjunction with, and then we started to understand a bunch of user stories about how do you people use it in the bathroom? How do people use it in the living room? How do people use it in the kitchen? So you then start to understand, for example, if you're designing creative for a campaign, what kind of situations you need to put in that campaign in terms of creative for advertising. So all of a sudden, what you're talking about starts to really connect with the audience. Um, so if you want to scale that approach, and you know that you're going to be tracking something ongoing for a long time, uh, then you can do something else. Instead of just creating taxonomies of like terms that fit into specific categories that you want to break down the data in, you uh, organize the data using AI. So you create an AI model that categorizes the data based on the categories that you have in mind. So we use this for brand trackers. So a, a company will come to us and say, we are monitoring the same 15 dimensions on how the audience is seeing us globally for the last 10 years. I'm not going to change that, even if you come with the snazziest social media data set for me. But I can only do this study once every five years. So if you give me some data daily or weekly to refresh that perception across that same set of categories, I can get a lot of value from that segmentation and, and brand tracking study. So what we did in this case and what we do with brand trackers is basically create an AI that categorizes the conversation around the brand along the lines of whatever survey brand tracking they're doing already. And then they get kind of like real time ongoing intelligence based on their existing brand tracker. And you can see over time how in this brand, for example, the conversation shifts from being international relationships to being conversation of what people want to invest in the, in the brand that is about to ICO. To IPO. Um, you can do the same with images. So, so this is a guy that everybody knows. And, um, uh, and uh, what is interesting, I'm not going to do a big kind of like Trump analysis, but the one of the things that we've done is analyzing 
the language that he uses, visual and written. And when you look at the visual language, this is pretty cool. So this is like images that he posted on his social media channels in the, from 2014 to 2016. What we do with the images is we use AI to understand the concepts that are visualized in those images. So if someone is playing golf in an image, the AI would tell me person, golf, sky, green, lawn, uh, whatever. Uh, so 2014, buildings, high rises, sport, probably golf, golf. So he's talking about real estate and golfing. 2014, high rise, more real estate, buildings, sport, but something starts to appear down here, crowd. But it's still pretty much his basic stuff. 2016, crowd. So more than half of what he's posting is about crowds. So he's obviously in full campaign mode and he's changed completely the way he communicates. Now you can do this on any political leader and you can really understand how the strategy is changing over time. And we do this to map how strategies change using this way of analyzing concepts. Um, you can do um, vertical specific AI to understand specific categories. So if you're analyzing a million pictures of like people discussing vegan recipes, you don't want to get a generic AI that tells you you have uh, people eating food, table, restaurant. It's too generic. You want to know what ingredients they're using. So what you do in this case is you analyze a million images, but you start pulling out avocado, tomato, bread because we trained an AI to recognize concepts that are granular enough to be relevant in a specific industry. It could be fashion, it could be finance, it could be anything. So in this case, we were able, for example, to build a whole menu with the most popular ingredients that people associate to vegan meals. Um, you can kind of like ladder things up and move to bigger systems. So you can analyze trends in this way. So one of the things that we do is we analyze in what is trending virally and what has got like a sustained interest from the audience. So in this case, we're measuring wellness trends and uh, you will see in things that are growing like plant-based diets, CBD, meditation, and things that are kind of like uh, slightly stuck, like kombucha, for example. Again, this is where the scrunchies came up. You can do it on fashion trends and you can see that biker shops, uh, shorts are eating up, but actually not maybe sustaining as much as animal print. So you can start using this to decide not only how you do your marketing, but also how you do your products. Obviously, you can ladder this up to political parties. So we're going to do one on the U election in the UK now to understand what parties and candidates are kind of like trending in this model. Um, we, did, we do this for analyzing TV shows. So you analyze like, a, this is for analysis of like 100 TV shows. And what we're doing is mapping what dimension is more prominent in making these shows go viral and uh, perform over time. And this way, and a company like Netflix or Hulu or NBC can use this information to structure the next kind of like creative development process and prioritize things that get them in that direction. Um, and what we started doing a lot of, and I'm almost done, is mapping our information spreads. So these blue dots are people sharing a video and the yellow dots are people resharing that video. So what we did was realizing that they look almost like brain scans. You can see how these one like four different videos that people are sharing and you can see how they spread around and who's responsible for spreading them more or less. Now, what we realize is that not only they spread in terms of you know, I'm taking something that you posted and I'm resharing it myself. But the way they spread is consistent with the, the way the audience is structured. And the audience is structured around what we call communities, but which are basically these colors that you see here, which are systems of affinities between the audience that go beyond demographics. They go just basically personality profiles, uh, taste profiles, anything that makes you similar to someone else in the audience. And what we realize is that when something spreads as fast as this, usually the audience is not very fragmented. And when something spreads as slowly as this one, usually you have an audience that is in this case almost four times as three times as fragmented as the other one, because that content needs to hop from one community to the other to be able to make it, which obviously has got a bunch of implications in terms of like finding the right influencers, finding the right campaign and spend strategy. And um, you know this applies to a bunch of different things. So start breaking down the audience of a gaming launch like Fortnite, you see different communities in it. 
and you see how that audience changes over time. And then you can start looking at, for example, how those different communities in the audience not only appear, but they engage with that product, the brand, the strategy in very different ways. So this is like, uh, have you guys seen this show, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo? It's a Netflix show, you know, in theory, really dull. It's about tidying up, you know, so how fucking, <laughs> this is very dull. Uh, but he engaged like a global audience on a number of fronts. But what's interesting is that the different types of people that got involved with it, people that are into politics and culture, writers and readers, uh, Brazilian uh, kind of like um, influencers, uh, Peronistas from Argentina, all sorts of different people got involved with it. And what you realize is that they talk about the show in very different ways. So politics and culture cluster talks about the show as a lens to read current affairs. So they talk about a show as a metaphor for Twitter algorithm or uh, for uh, racial imbalances in the US. Um, people from Brazil talk about it just to show that they're doing it. So they post pictures of them tidying up. And then, this is one of the funniest ones, the most highbrow audience use it in a like, kind of like ironic way. So they go, I watched the first episode of the Marie Kondo show, the one where the guy angrily demands that his part-time working wife who raises their two toddlers alone do more laundry and clearly, con married the name of the lady, doesn't work because by the end of the episode, he's still there. <laughs> All right, this one. Watched a few episodes of the Marie Kondo show and now I can see negative anti-joyful auras around everything in my house. I suspect Chick Gnome sculpture sent me into a spiral of depression last August. <laughs> They're all the same by community. So when we found that out, we just got like, okay, we're on to something here. So I'm gonna skip that. But what we did was building this model and I'm done, which is basically the idea that you can personalize your strategy by looking at the conversation around an audience, around the topic, breaking down the audience in communities of affinities and taste profile, then look at how these different communities engage with the, top, the same topic very differently, and then adapt the way you spend money, the way you design your targeting, and the way you craft your creative strategy. And usually we see results that are like three times better than when we do control campaigns to check against this level of personalization. So when we talk about personalization, it's not one-to-one, -one, but it's like one-to community. So it's one to few, let's put it that way. And that's what we say when we mean that the audience is the message. Well, thank you, Francesco. Um.